up next we have a panel discussion the topic is unlocking retail success embracing omni channel strategies in the digital era to moderate this panel ladies and gentlemen join me in welcoming on stage mr sandeep jain sales director adobe category leader apparel coco blue retail limited over to you gentlemen well, first of all i'm going to move the chair this side so i can see all of them this feel a little bit like a swayam bird doesn't it <laughs> all right so uh, thank you so much first of all to the esteemed panel over here we really appreciate the time you've taken out to be a part of this panel It's going to be a great topic. I'm sure it's very dear to all your hearts. And thank you so much to all the audience. You know, uh, I think it's going to be a great session, some great insights. Uh, and I think we just have one hour. We have uh, six panelists. We have a lot of audience. So without further ado, I think I'm just going to dive into it. All right. And I want to keep a little bit of time in the end for the audience questions. So I'll probably get through my questions, you know, as soon as I can. Uh, I think uh, since we have people sitting in a line and not in a circle, we'll probably go through the questions, you know, one by one. Unless I feel some question is more relevant to somebody, <laughs> right? And I'll do that. All right. So I think I'll begin with uh, Abhishek. Uh, thanks for coming. Uh, obviously, the topic is about omni-channel, right? Uh, and you know, businesses they have to effectively integrate their online, offline channels to enhance the customer experience. how do you think is the best they do this okay uh, thank you uh, hi everyone uh, i'm abhishek i represent a 90 year old brand called lacoste in india uh, so good question as an uh, omni channel i think probably this word is uh, a buzz from last uh, n number of years i can't say exactly how many uh, we were uh, kind of very early adopter to this word when we really uh, started seeing as in how we can do an endless aisle to really Uh, capitalize on whatever inventory that we have uh, with the help of technology as well as uh, it can bring some more uh, customer satisfaction when we can actually serve them even if the product is not available in the store we can we can get it from some other store and do it however i would uh, uh, from that time till now i think uh, there have been a uh, few challenges which are uh, kind of consistent in the market and uh, at least to our understanding and are yet to be solved and how we are solving is it, it, it's difficult as far as technology is concerned as i always say to my team it's easy to buy hard to implement uh, uh, there's no doubt who are the actual users of this technology we need to understand so i'll just give you an example of why software alone cannot solve this so if i don't have a particular size available in my store i am the store manager of store a and it is available in store b if i am fulfilling that order i have been incentivized for fulfilling that order uh, from my store 
but this guy is getting penalized because i am utilizing his product for my sale so there are chances that he may not be as keen as i am to fulfill that sale so then you have to incentivize this guy as well now if i am incentivizing this guy and probably the sale is coming and hypothetically if it is an online order then if i am fulfilling it and if it is not it is getting returned then it goes to my central warehouse wherein both of us lose so as technology as endless il as omni channel approach there are few certain areas which are still not solved we need to do that and the most important thing as far as omni channel is concerned i think gst really needs to be solved build from one state return to other state i think been discussing this for a very long time this needs to be solved now okay great great i think that was a really good insight and uh, you know i can best term it as work in progress right obviously i don't think any technology vendor can solve a gst problem unfortunately <laughs> if we have some people from the government here maybe they can take a note of it but uh, you know that's a great segue to my next question uh, and i'll i'll you know guide it to anupam uh, from from what uh, abhishek just said do you think or or rather ask how do you think data analytics can be leveraged to improve this omni channel strategies you know all the difficulties you spoke about you think data analytics can be used to lever uh, can be leveraged to solve those problems thanks for this question and thanks to all of you for <coughs> joining us i represent decathlon uh, i lead marketing at decathlon and in decathlon we really understood that to start this process we have to understand the problem statement and we feel that from where we started is the solution you are building is not for you but for the customer and the customer is deciding today to being omni channel to have that omni experience for a long time we used to feel that customer is deciding to purchase a product after he or she has reached to a store but actually they are finding it online they are researching it online they are understanding it everything and then deciding whether to buy at store or buy online for long we have said store is about experience and online is about convenience so in terms of using data how you can be useful to the customer is personalization you can provide the personalization which is also the experience a customer is looking at the digital platform if we talk we can talk about recommendations again using the data it again helps in the topic which we are trying to resolve for customer where we see it is for convenience so to take an example if you are buying a football shoe i'll take example of sport just coming from the cap one you might be really interested to know that people really buy a you know for football jersey when they're buying a shoe or at least a sock so the advantage again of data is that you can really help the customer the mindset is there in the recommendation then it really helps when you use data analytics to also help a customer what customers like them are buying so something which uh, a lot of companies use as trending so you really utilize that trending as an opportunity and not to forget something which is very easy to work on supply chain to work on availability of the product to work also on the specific location where what kind of products are being useful or the data or the knowledge is being useful for the customers so i really feel if the direction is more what customer wants and then using data analytics link to that it really helps so that's what is is really helping uh, in terms of using data analytics wow thanks and you know that that's that's a great point and answer because even we at adobe our mantra for the last year or maybe two years has been personalization at scale like how do you personalize uh, from you know n is to 1 to maybe few is to 1 to 1 is to 1 right and i think that's exactly what what you were hinting at so ashish on that question right i mean or or on with the uh, insight that we got from anupam and he said that people usually do a lot of research online then they come to the store 
so how can you you know uh, basically optimize the physical store to improve the experience of the customers to be as good as the experience they have online thank you uh, hi i'm ashish hi i represent shadow facts shadow facts basically is one of the leading uh, uh, logistics player and who, and we fulfill uh, i would say end to end to the last mile deliveries whether it's uh, directly from the client warehouses or directly from the stores so actually um, well well uh, we were discussing about decathlon decathlon actually is is one of the the primary players that we work with uh, coming to how how can the store enhance that customer experience i think um, I'll, I'll just add to from from the data perspective and basically uh, the time has come towards wherein the expectation of the customer used to be that uh, you used to get an order delivered in 3 days 4 days to 10 minutes and so that is where where we are moving towards and that is where uh, the experience or the customer expectation has moved towards uh, and that is where the omni channel will play the larger role while while uh, uh, you can bring the store closer to the customer but you can't bring all the sqs or the, the products closer to the customer and that is where the, the offline stores come into the picture uh, while you can have maybe a limited set of sqs which are high selling items at that the stores and and can bring in that experience but you can also give that option to the customer in terms of maybe having those kiosk or or wherein wherein the person can directly look and choose and feel so what is what is the store needed for you just want to try it out experience that part and see whether whether it has the right fit or or it looks good on you or not but of course you can't keep everything there and hence the larger thought process comes in wherein you can can still keep the kiosk wherein the person can still browse maybe the store has 5000 odd items but you can still have 50000 items shown on those kiosks where he can still choose the color and texture of those things and can get it delivered to the to the to the his respective house uh, uh, in in maybe next 30 minutes or so and that is that is something that that you would want it to be A simple example uh, between me and my wife uh, she prefers offline or or buying very when i prefer online that that it, it's basically if she wants experience i'm a lazy person i i, I don't want to go and there is the option that i also want more options to be there i i would want to choose from 100 options rather than just just 10 options so that is that is how i think that the role of omni will will play in, in the larger scheme of things when it comes to the offline online ordering wow so you are suggesting that the offline stores also provide provide an endless aisle in there right i think that's a great idea all right now i took one point from what you said is that your wife prefers offline and that's very pertinent to the gentleman sitting next to you because of what he sells right <laughs> <laughs> there's carrot in the name right and when it comes to carrot we think yeah, we don't it comes comes mostly to women so atul are you thinking of personalization at a one is to one scale for what you do and how important is that for you um it's very important for us and i think actually for most retailers um, when customers walk into a store um the more or whether they are interacting with your brand online you know any kind of mass communication it just bounces off the customer right because they are just so used to seeing mass communication it has no interest they have no interest on that on that what they want to know is i am here and what are you doing for me right how are you making this experience for me special and um, whether it is your marketing communication and we spoke about a few things about how can we make how can we make our communication to that customer relevant for them you know if you are searching for rings and i talk to you about earrings she's going to be not interested right but how do i show you based on the kind of rings you have browsed how do i show you more similar rings at similar price points right making you you know go deeper in your journey of building desire to words buying the product uh, and i think for omni channel brands and companies the biggest step is how do you link what's happening online to what's happening in stores right because the customer may she may have browsed your product online but again most women would want to go to a store before they make their final purchase and they want to see the product and experience it um and when they come to the store if they are going to have to restart their journey saying oh this is what i was looking for you have lost all that one is to one information you had about her so what we do at carrot lane and what i think uh, is now imperative for every retailer is to make sure that we are able to sync that information 
uh, and empower your teams at the stores saying that this is what the customer was looking at. This is the item she has in her cart already. Yeah. And if you have that in the store, you need to bring that out and be able to show it to her. Right? Uh, if you have personal information about, I mean, at Carrot Lane, it's, um, you know, if we, m many customers will share their birthday and anniversary with us, right? They, they give us that data. Uh, it's important for us then to be able to know when a customer walks in. If it is a special day for her, I need to make her feel special. Uh, the moment you bring in emotions into your brand that goes beyond just a transaction, you have a customer who's going to keep coming back to you. Absolutely. And in fact, uh, I remember uh, I was attending one of, uh, one of the classes at ISB and a professor asked, you know, what is the sweetest thing that anyone in the world likes to hear? What is the sweetest thing that falls in a eardrum? And the answer is your name. You know, whenever somebody like who doesn't know you, etc., and they call you by your name, it feels really good, right? So I think, Jitendra, moving on to what Atul said, right? Uh, you can collect lots of data online, right? And he said that basically you collect birthdays, etc., anniversaries. Can you elaborate more on you know how that can be used to personalize the in-store shopping experience? To give this answer. Actually, uh, I would like to give you a story. Uh, story in terms of expectations, myself as a customer. So let's assume I'm going to a, a footwear store and I bought a marathon running shoes, probably let's say four months, five months back. I bought a running shoes for uh, my mother, uh, sorry, a walking shoes for my mother, probably uh, one month back and I bought uh, tennis shoes for my son and I'm going there to return that particular shoes because there is a size issue. Now, assume the salesperson, a uh, person cashier on the store, he sees my detail and checks and the systems from an online channel where it collects the data that this particular customer has bought a running shoes, not even this year, but he's been buying every six months. So that's a trend, he can understand. So based on that, system can give them a cohort to the customer that it's probably a customer, it's a marathon runner because he's been consistently buying a running shoes. So based on that, if the system can also give a recommendations based on what are the marathon runs being happened during this last one year and what are going to happen in the next six months time. So things a profound impact which can give to a customer where he can check, sir, I think you are a marathon runner and I hope that you have run a Tata marathon. So what was your performance? How do you like you used our shoes? Can you please give us some feedback? So when you start engaging with a customer and then ask about their personal experience, people love to tell about themselves. So it is not just about telling about your product. It is telling about what they have liked, what they have done, Everybody loves to speak about themselves. That's as a human being, it's a human nature. So if you touch that experience and probably a liking of the customer to tell about them, it gives an emotional feeling. So you start engaging with that customer, you tell them how, whether you like that product and also like you also walked a walking shoes, whether it was for your mother or wife, do you, do you like the product? So it starts a conversation, it creates an engagement with the customer give them a better experience. That time when you purchase a product, which is a walking, or a, probably let's say a, a, a tennis shoes probably for my son, and I want to return it on the store, if I can do the return, and at the same time, customer can, the salesperson can also tell, there are new collections available in the store, do you want to try it? You also have a coupon available based on the purchase that you have done online. Can you like to re redeem that particular coupon? So. That's a, like a complete omni-channel experience which you can give to a customer. It gives a delighting experience and once you make a customer delight, absolutely it becomes a successful transaction. Wow, I think that's, that's again really good, you know, a great story and, and good examples. I remember way back when I used to shop from uh, Nordstrom in the US. Obviously there was no online offline stitching at that time, but the experience that you're talking about, I remember that one store still, I. I've not probably gone to the store in the last 12 years since I've been in India, but I still remember the best experience I had because once you walk in that store, 
they were so personalized to you, you know, at the, the same we're talking, maybe not, obviously they don't have much data about you, but the service they offered you was just very much like what you said. Excellent. All right, so we'll switch gears a little bit, Prashant, now, right? Uh, we are still talking about in-store in -store only, but in what ways can in-store technologies like, say, AR or VR, uh, interactive kiosk, et cetera, can they improve the customer experience in physical stores, you think? Thanks, Sandeep. Uh, I'm Prashant. I represent Coco Blue. We help uh, brands sell in online channel. So, yeah, Omni Channel is a very exciting opportunity. Uh, it sort of helps brands reach out to much more large customer base, which is not possible to reach out uh, when you are operating in a small catchment of a store. So, uh, first of all, uh, brands can leverage e-commerce or online channel to draw a lot of customers to their stores. It's a big source of footfall uh, to a store. Uh, then once the customer enters the store, like uh, uh, my fellow panel member was saying, personalization can actually kick in where imagine a customer scans a QR code uh, in the kiosk that is installed inside the store and uh, the details just pop up. And then there is either a personal stylist or a, a, a store a, a promoter who can actually help guide the customer around basis the preferences. So basis cohort analysis, basis lot of segmentation, we can classify the customer as uh, say a marathon runner or, uh, or a swimmer or a gymnast or something. And then uh, that, that personalization can kick in. And then the stores can actually use a lot of technologies like AR, VR and so on. Uh, to actually provide an immersive experience to the customer. Now it is possible that a lot of those products might not be available in that particular store, right? That's where uh, you provide a virtual experience to the customer in terms of try-ons, where the customer can try on, uh, do a virtual try-on of a product and then place an order through the kiosk in the store where, the, where, they, where uh, some inventory check can be done, where this product is available either in a nearby store or on the brand's warehouse when it can be delivered to the customer directly. So uh, the, this actually can come in handy when uh, inventory, we are talking about very diverse product categories like fashion, where not all kinds of styles and sizes can be made available in a particular store or maybe in a, say, an airport kiosk, right? Uh, you, it's very tough to sort of uh, distribute inventory across so many stores. So inventory management can become more efficient, try-ons can become more and more, uh, say, uh, efficient, and then you can actually convert customers more uh, and provide a seamless experience. Wow, I, I think you provide a great example, right, of fashion and with VR. And, you know, you don't know how a yellow polo neck would look on you, right, but you can experience. And, in fact, another industry I can think of that is the paint industry. Right? And people have, have uh, deployed that very, very efficiently, where they basically make a 3D model of your house, and then you just throw the paints on the wall in the VR, and you can realize, you know, or visualize how it looks. And I think you touch on a very important point about inventory. So I'm going to swing right back to Abhishek over here, because for him, I'm sure inventory management is not so easy. <laughs> so Abhishek, uh, challenges, opportunities in integrating online, offline inventory management, you know, and how do you manage that to ensure a seamless experience across channels, not just online, not just offline, across channels, how do you manage that inventory management? I, it, to me, as a non-retailer, it seems like a nightmare. I think inventory management and inventory optimization is the right word, probably, I will say, uh, is, is very important for all the retailers now. Uh, what we understood during COVID is how we can really leverage technology in terms of optimizing our inventory. Uh, uh, before uh, COVID, we used to have separate inventory for separate channels, you know, uh, and then there was no technology which was actually stitching all the inventories together. Now, if you, if you talk to me today, I, uh, except one marketplace, I don't send my physical inventory to any of the marketplace. Everything is lying there in my studio, my own mother warehouse. Uh, through one single warehouse, I am catering to all my seven channels together. The second leg of this is uh, when store inventory is also getting stitched along with warehouse inventory. 
and this whole thing becomes seamless. You can actually deliver from wherever it is available. Uh, the fashion cycle is also getting reduced now. So if you see typically two season and one season now, uh, six months out of six months, I think end of season sale is also now 45 to 50 days now. So it means you have only 90 days of full price in when, uh, uh, period where you can actually uh, maximize your profit in terms of buy selling product. With online, the biggest challenge is the moment the product goes out of your warehouse and by the time it comes back, which is 30-35% and my friend from Coco Blue can really <laughs> say this, it means for 30 days that product is not available on the shelf anywhere and if in case you have fulfilled it from store, then so it goes for 45 days also because the return will come someplace and it will go some other place and so and so forth. So inventory optimization I think is one of the key challenges. We have been able to solve it to the extent possible by centralizing everything with the help of technology for online channel. The online offline, uh, the combination of online offline is something which I still see a lot way to do. A lot of companies uh, sitting in this room as in people can take, say they actually expanded too much but then they scaled down because it is not easy to manage omni deliveries from store operational point of view. Three things uh, which actually uh, kind of create a lot of uh, difficulties in doing. First is revenue share arrangement with mall developers. Right? Whatever that you do online sales etc. You have to pay revenue share of that. That's a practical problem. Any offline retailer would know uh, what I'm saying. That's one. Second, uh, all these on online channels, they ask the return to be captured with thousand cameras in and around this angle, that angle. Then only I will give you your uh, claim. Otherwise, I will not give you your claim. That's the second problem uh, that people <laughs> face. And the third problem is how you really uh, actually mobilize your own manpower motivate them to fulfill online orders also because all the online orders that they fulfill, they are killing their own incentive in the offline channel. So probably these are the three challenges that is there. One, as far as technology is concerned, I think technology is bang on ready. We have uh, ready technology, we can deploy it any day to solve this problem. It's only we need to solve these three problems. Wow, you know, this, this reminds me of a, I think a line Harsha Bogle always says that he made that shot look so easy. Right? I mean, such a difficult problem, but you didn't make it sound as difficult, so kudos to you. <laughs> and you touched on a good point about the evolving expectations of this, of the modern consumer, you know, especially in the digital era. So I'd like to ask Anupam, you know, like how do you, how do retailers adapt to this, you know, to meet, or what are their strategies to meet this evolving expectations of the new age consumer? Thank you. First of all, I'm very happy. A lot of people are talking about sport and sport products. Looks a bright future for sports companies, decathlon included. I'm not going to be very exclusive. But I think uh, the expectation really had a d big change post-COVID. So we, we, due to the situation and circumstances, a lot of people became on digital only in terms of customers. And a lot of tech solutions were built, a lot of companies moved too fast also on digital. But what we realized that post that, also consumer went back, what they wanted was experience. So as I said, once you start from the topic of customer, it becomes much easier because you always think, okay, if he or she is evolving, how should I evolve? I feel the the main topics on which the expectation lies is that when they are on the digital platforms, they want convenience. That means they want the products to be available. They want it faster. Something which I won't blame marketplaces, but everywhere is discounting, <laughs> offers, and, and in the end is the returns. So you need to be super careful on that platform as well that what you are offering, at least for a player like Decathlon is cannot be different than what you're offering in the store. So first thing in the terms of expectation which you have to keep is that my platforms are not giving different experiences at least on the topic like a price or availability. The second expectation which is great is sometimes if you want to offer a retail experience on online so you become very tech savvy, you, you start too many things on your digital platform in the end can hit your uh, platform itself and their stability. But what 
is important in all these expectations is to again keep an eye on the data analytics is to see finally what they are expecting when they are going on different platforms. For instance, today we know that a lot of search is happening online and then the purchase is happening at the store. But at the same time, all the products may not be present at the store also. So that's why I like the example when we were talking about a presence at your store, not only in terms of the tool, but also in terms of behavior. The behavior of the team at the store has to be also on, stop on, uh, on the point that if a customer wants a product which is not in the store, you can help the customer to buy online. Of course, there are topics linked to the store sales, etc. But in the end, the customer comes first. So that's the other experience and expectation you have to fulfill. And the one more expectation which somehow we are managing is that if a customer is buying online, they can in fact even return at the store. That's another expectation. You don't become platform uh, uh, independent in your mind, but you remain a omni-channel as a concept. So uh, one more topic which is very well being experienced by everybody is the kind of reviews which a customer is seeing today. So it's not that the customer doesn't see only review of the product, but they also see the review of your retail locations. And if you have presence at multiple places in the city, they do see those reviews to also decide which location to go based on the parking availability, the stock availability, the experience with the uh, team members inside the store. So I think these are the more normal topics on which uh, as, a, as a company, as a brand, you need to be careful at. But if you know the expectation of customer becomes easier than the other way around where you are knowing your expectation but trying to fulfill it. Wow, I think those answers come really, you know, shows that you have definitely worked ground up. You know, from I, I would <laughs> want to add. To sure. Uh, so basically, if, if we see how things have evolved in the last four or five years. So I'll, I'll start with the COVID time. Before that, pre-COVID, it was more about going out to buy. And it was a physical store wherein people used to go and buy. Then came COVID and then everything moved from an offline to an online kind of an experience. Not by choice, but, but it had to be done. Then again, post-COVID, again, when, when there was an opportunity to go out and buy, people again started moving towards that side of things. And of course, the mix again changed in, in that fashion. Uh, I think the, the next set of change came when, I think in the last 12, 14 months, when this quick commerce disrupted the market like anything. And then, and, and they, as of now, are still in that phase and trying to bring in, moving from an FNV kind of a seller to, to adding a lot of e-commerce categories, say your beauty, fashion, general merchandise, and other things that they're, they're trying to bring in. Again, it is again shifting towards an online. What is, what is something that they are able to add? When a person tries to go for an online shopping, it's more about an instant gratification. I'm not ready to wait for a day or a two or something. Now with the quick commerce coming in, that, that 10, 20 minutes of experience is again coming to home, rather than you have to go out for that. Again, a part of it has to be solved, wherein you still have a lot of category that needs to be unlocked. And, and you also want to, uh, and they also need to solve that part of while they've been able to solve the, the forward kind of side of the journey, of course, the exchange and returns are something that they also need to look at. But that's how I, I would see the last four or five years uh, customer shift happening in, in, when it comes to the online, offline kind of world. I'm sorry, uh, Ashish, just to add what you are saying, and probably I have a different view when it comes to quick commerce. Not everything is required quick. I don't think, and this is something I think as, as brand, as uh, this is the responsibility that we should take, why one need a shirt quickly in half an hour? Do you want that shirt to be worn now and go out? So quick commerce, especially fashion apparel sector, I don't think there is any need of it. It is my personal view, it can be. But why do you want to promote this quick commerce in fashion? This is not something which like your pizza will be delivered to you in 30 minutes. Are you going to eat that shirt? No. But then why are we as brand pushing this quick commerce on the customers that I will deliver your product in 30 minutes? If the fear is that the product, the order will get cancelled, then it's better that you are saving on a lot of cost because the product will anyways come if the customer is not ready. 
So as far as quick commerce trend is concerned in fashion, I think it is uh, something that we should really restrain ourselves and shouldn't really promote this. That's, that's probably my view. I, I would just add, uh, probably up years ago, people were asking why do we need even fruits and vegetables in 10, 20 minutes. I think that question is answered as of now. And actually, a lot of brands themselves are moving. So it's basically, it's not, I think the brand choice, but probably it's a customer choice and customers have been spoiled in that manner, wherein they, the expectation has started shifting. Of course, as I said, it's, it's a long journey. We don't know how it will shape out, but that's how the status quo is. I know so some really you know, good uh, healthy debates going on over here. And I, I've always been very fond of you know, debates. I wish we had more time. And we could, you know, debate more, maybe have two See, teams. I want to add some point into it based on my own experience. See, uh, I do agree to a point that in fashion, it is not a quick commerce like a pizza. But it could be a quick commerce or probably a expectation of a product by today evening. Because I need the product by today evening or probably I need the product by tomorrow morning. I'll give an example from my own personal experience. Like... Uh, since being a marathon, so uh, I had an experience, my, I was about to do a race, the next day my race was, and I was unable to locate my uh, marathon running shorts. So, you know, in marathon running shorts, you need a shorts with multiple zips and pockets to keep gels and all. So, I cannot use any other shorts. And since I didn't have the short, any other, I was really panicked. I said, I need the product. But this is a kind of typical shorts, which is not available in any other local stores nearby. It's a very specific shorts. So I searched on Decathlon. I checked whether the product is available. <laughs> they, I got the message, you. you can get the product, but after three days time. But my race was tomorrow. What I'm doing to do now? I checked, thanks to Decathlon, I checked whether the inventory is available in nearby store because they exposed the entire inventory there. I checked, yeah, the stock is available in Malad store, which is near to my house. I thought, lucky, I've, I've been saved. I went to the store, picked up the product, and thought, okay, wow, I've been saved now. So that's a kind of personal experience. Here what? Technology gives a delighted experience to a customer. So that was the first time I purchased from Decathlon. And trust me, I am a regular customer of Decathlon now. Because I love the experience that I get the inventory, I get whatever is available in online, whatever is available in the store. I can check what I like, where it is available. If it is nearby, I can, at, le at least I can go there and pick it up. So, just my personal experience. Not a quick comment, I, I, I think that's great. Something eh? really example, you came yeah. up with and actually answered Abhishek's question. Why would we need shorts in half an hour? <laughs> Maybe a marathon was in two hours. <laughs> so, you would have needed that time. You know? So, let, let's uh, shift gears once again. And going from speed of delivery or, or you know, the, the uh, extent of inventory, let's go to the speed of delivering content actually now. Right? I mean, all you guys uh, must be having loads of content, if not on your own website, through you know, something else in the form of assets, in the form of maybe articles, bloggers, vloggers, what have you. So I'll pose a question to the carrot man over here, right? Uh, are you looking at real-time content distribution? You know, forget real-time delivery of marathon shorts. So um, I think... Uh, the real-time content distribution comes in the context of the one-to-one -one marketing to that customer, right? Um, if you are going to, you, you can always have two modes. One is when you are talking about, let's say for Carrot Lane, we're talking about a new collection that we've launched, then obviously we've planned for it and we're going to talk about the collection and have that, you know, communication go out to everybody. But when you go back and think that this customer, when she is beginning to engage with me, what is it that will trigger this um, desire for her even further. And for each customer, that could be a different trigger. Somebody could be looking for a discount. Somebody could be looking for uh, a special occasion purchase. Somebody could be looking for your new designs. Uh, and that's the stage when you really need to be able to build your content, adapt your content, and be able to deliver it to that customer based on what the trigger for her is going to be. OK, interesting. So. Basically, you're saying is not just just personalization, but actually different content distribution for different customers. Wow, and that must be difficult to manage. So it is when the customer is on your platform, 
it actually is much easier, right? Because she's on your website. Then you have control of how you want to do and what you want to do. Okay, so now in and fact, we're going the reverse way around. You go from what you could get into experience, you're offering now online yeah, experience. Yeah. And when you go one level deeper, then you have you know, triggers like email and WhatsApp, which is again content you are distributing, but again, you are controlling how you want to do it. The most difficult one to crack is if you want to try and do it in a third party location, right? I mean, that's not something we've been able to do yet. Nice, nice. You, did you have something to add, I thought? Yeah, just wanted to add that it's, it's also linked to the engagement as a target because the content will help you to keep a engagement over a different period of time. Because I think purchase is a very end result or a consequence and for some business units, the purchase will not be like Amazon, that every day you're buying something. So I think content personalization is a key when you're targeting engagement as a target because the purchase as a consequence will not happen so frequent for every business uh, entity. Going back to the previous point on quick delivery or you know, the debate on quick or not. That seems uh, to be a popular topic. <laughs> no, I just want to share uh, that it's every almost every day we will get at least a few calls from panicking men saying you know what it's my anniversary tomorrow yeah <laughs> and i need something tonight can i please you know have some necklace or ring or whatever and but i need it in my home and i'm working or whatever i'm busy i don't have time to come to your store so uh, in our category it is a real need not half an hour but same day delivery and Aren't those your highest margin customers? <laughs> <laughs> right? yeah. The guilt makes us spend more money. <laughs> so we don't have much time left. So basically, I'm just going to uh, skip a few you know, good questions I had. But I'm going to move on now to digital campaigns. Uh, Prashant, question for you. Uh, I know that you, know, you guys do a lot of digital campaigns, right? And probably all of you over here do. And what I've observed over the years is that the marketing team gets the budget for the campaign, they do the campaign, and then you really don't have an exact ROI of kya hua, right? So do you have any tools or do you have in mind how would you measure the impact of a digital campaign or the performance of that? Yeah, in fact, uh, that's the benefit of uh, digital marketing, that you can measure the impact, you can get a lot of data, a lot of insights, a lot of patterns, a lot of trends. A uh, lot of analysis that can be done and data mining can be done, which is possible now to a very detailed extent. Uh, so we uh, do use a tool called Amazon Pi. Uh, it's, a, it's a marketing tool. It provides a very detailed segment-based analysis. Uh, you can slice the data in any uh, say detail as possible. You can do keyword searches. You can, you can, you can uh, also do a lot of customer segment analysis what did customer buy, end up buying, what, did, what was his, in his consideration set, uh, which alternate product did the customer end up buying, right? Which is a competitor analysis. Uh, it gives you market share, uh, gives you, uh, so it's a very, very smart tool, which is very adaptive as well. A uh, lot of campaigns can be configured at the same time, uh, and it, it, it works on an algorithm where the best, surf, best performing campaign keeps surfacing to the customer. And you can keep, uh, say, fine-tuning your campaign basis, the results that you're getting. Um, so that those kind of tools are very, very handy in the digital world. Provide you a lot of, uh, like we were discussing earlier, earlier marketing team would just be worried about the budget. They would not be worried about the ROI, what are they actually getting out of it. And now sales and marketing teams have started working, started collaborating, actually. Uh, they have also become very demanding now. Uh, people are becoming more educated about uh, these terms of ROAS and uh, and cost of sale and so on. So uh, that's actually helping and uh, the ca campaigns are getting optimized more and more. All right. So you're, you're, you're saying that now you're able to get near accurate results of the campaigns and then you're able to use that data to curate your next campaign also. Yeah, absolutely. All right. That's great. Great. Jitendra. One quick question for you. Again, a little bit different topic, but uh, we got to try and hit all topics here. So what we're observing is that reading retailers are talking, you know, they're taking proactive approach to privacy and governance as a means to build trust and effectively manage risk. What are your thoughts on this? Sorry, can you please repeat again? Sure, sure. It's basically about uh, governance, right? Uh, you're taking proactive approaches 
to uh, make sure there's privacy and there's governance of all the data that you get. Uh, so what are your thoughts on the same? Because there's so many laws coming up right now. So things are taking up now. I would not say there is a very concrete way people have started because the law has already been passed, which have given us specific guidelines that how based on that you have to first take the consent of a customer, whether you would like to do a communication to them, how the way you want to do a communication. Uh, there is a guideline based on that people have started adopting, being ourselves as a technology solution provider. We have also started adopting to those guidelines within the system where at the time, let's say a customer walks into the store within our customer uh, POS solution where the customer is checking in. We give them an options that whether you want to do those campaigns, whether the customer is ready to opt, then the customer gets an OTP and based on that, they give the preference what type of communication I would like to do. Uh, based on that communications, those kind of personalizations or personal data protection has also been captured upon. Uh, there are more things which have to be evolved based on that. Uh, in terms of personalization, like uh, the data, the way we have been working upon that the customer's personal data had been kept in an encrypted way. So even the people within the organization, if they want to access the entire customer history and their personal information is not been available through authorizations, that's the way based on those areas we have been working upon. Okay, thanks. And I mean, I had a hidden agenda to asking this question because Whichever client we approach, for any of our solution, you know, we try and go to the CDO, the CMO, then obviously the CIO because, you know, that's person very important to adopt or, uh, you know, take over any uh, digital solution. But we are forced to convince the CISO. The, you know, he's always there and he's got this list of criteria and he throws in a face, are you meeting all his criteria? Privacy, governance, check, 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 check. Otherwise, I can never sell my solutions. All right. so. Because we had you know, great debates and we couldn't uh, cover all the questions we had, but it's very important for the audience to know the person behind the profession. Right? So far you were talking all your professional language, what do you do? I'm going to ask you guys a personal question. And it's going to be the same question for all of you. So you can just you know, go in sequence over here, starting with uh, Mr. Raj. Uh, it's a two-part question, but it's very simple. What is the first thing that comes to your mind when you wake up every morning, maybe except Sunday, and what motivates you? Oh, a difficult one. Every day's motivation is different. Uh, but I think uh, uh, the best part is, uh, let's finish what I left uh, yesterday, is what my today's motivation is. Because uh, uh, believe me, in corporate world, nobody can really finish their job in one day and move uh, to the next day. But finish what I left uh, is what my motivation is for the next day. And what is the first thought that comes? Is there a first thought comes to your mind also every morning when you wake up? <laughs> no, I don't think. The first thing is whether I'm on time or I'm late. That's the first thing in my mind. <laughs> <laughs> Anupam. It, very interesting. So it, it reminds something which we, which we believe in and the way we work is do what you love. So... I think the first thing which comes in as a motivation for day is that am I going to continue what I love? The, the good part is that you have almost 14 years at Decathlon, so it, wow. it, it really helps in, in that direction. The first thing which comes in mind when I wake up is my daughter has a school today or not? <laughs> <laughs> and what kind of responsibilities have been assigned to me already, and, and I should be spot on that. Uh, but yeah, that's that's how the the day goes. Except the Sundays, where we have an opportunity to play some sport together, me and my daughter. So yeah, but yeah, in terms of the motivation for day, is to continue to do what you love. Uh, and there are a lot of good examples people given that yeah, I'm doing good. Very nice, Ashish. Yeah. Uh, on the professional side, uh, when we started nine years back, the larger thought of starting this business was to create job opportunities for the for the for the people, uh, and, and it was more about how do we create this delivery delivery boy job and a more lucrative kind of thing. So that's something that we, as of now, the thought was always remain that how can we create more jobs and more and more jobs is something that is there, uh, and uh, it was also a vision when we had started at that time was to to cover each and every nook and corner of India. Well, that journey continues, we are almost there in at least 80-85% of the country. So that is something 
that 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 vision keeps going, and then that's something we as founders, founding mem team members, we always keep discussing as to how do we drive that part day in day out. That is something that that has always been there. Wow, nice, Atul. Um, so again, for me, I have a ten-year-old son. So the first thing is get him ready and get him on See, time. See, life exists the beyond omni channel. <laughs> <laughs> But uh, what motiv motivates me every day is, um, um, you know, there was a time when we used to look up to older people and more experienced people uh, to learn new things. Uh, and, you know, at Carrot Lane, we have a very young team and I'm all the time learning new things from these young people out there in my office. Um, so really, it's just the, the idea of being able to learn something new every day that gets me excited about work. Wow, nice. Jitendra? See, my motivations comes from two areas. One activity which if I complete before time, the other activity which I complete more than the targeted time. These are two contrast activity which I do and both of them gives me a good kick. Uh, every day if I have a running target, I have let's say 10k to be done in X number of minutes. If I complete the target in before minute, it gives me a kick, excitement, okay. Uh, that means it's a wow, it's a wonderful day. I've been able to do it. Being an IT sales where I need to, need to meet multiple customers, I need to meet with CTO, CIO, uh, where if I have a specific meeting with them, they give me a stipulated time, hey, you have 45 minutes window, whatever you have to pitch, just give within 45. The more I stretch, the more kick I get. That's my motivation. <laughs> so that's an excitement that the person gives me 45 minutes time, but I would be able to extend to one or 30 minutes time. So that's an excitement to be. So there are two different diversified activity which gives me a kick. Very nice. I think that's the first time hearing that from anybody. Beautiful, very unique. Prashant. Very nicely put, Jitend. So uh, for me, uh, because uh, I work in an e-commerce world, it's 24-7, it's always on. So the thing that worries me most first thing in the morning is, did something break down in the last night? <laughs> like, did any... Thing, then any outage happen, did any pricing error happen, did any sort of inventory uh, get depleted or so on. So immediately I have to check WhatsApp, emails, uh, alerts and so on, the dashboards. That's the first thing that worries me. Uh, what motivates me uh, is that uh, continuous, the zeal for continuous improvement. We all live in a competitive world. It's a very dynamic, ever-changing world. So continuous improvement is the mantra. We cannot sort of, what got us here will not got, get us to the next level. So that keeps uh, motivating me and I draw a lot of inspiration from that. Very nice, very nice. We have just a few seconds left. Any questions from the audience? Yes, sir. Hi, uh, my name is Surinder. I work in the domain of retail experience design. So my question is to Anupam. So, uh, I'm a big, big uh, brand loyalist of uh, Decathlon. I keep going to your store quite often in Bangalore. And I used to always wonder, I, I, I go so often, so I even notice changes in your layout and your planogramming. So I used to always wonder, is, do you use uh, technology to optimize your planogram? Because of being omni-channel, you have uh, you know, merchandise being bought online and store being the fulfillment center. I, I guess it's a fulfillment center too. And you have also uh, phys uh, customers physically walking to the store who are also expecting experience. So how do you kind of manage that? Uh, so first of all, thank you for, uh, you know, being with Decathlon. It's a pleasure of ours. Uh, if I understood the question well, you said that in our physical store, when our layouts keep changing, what's the thought process behind that? No, if I understood no, well. Do you use technology uh, for the planogramming? Because you're doing solution selling. There are True. multiple categories, multiple products within a category. True. So for doing the presentation, which is easy for the customer to find, browse and find. So are you using technology for doing that? Okay. Uh, so first of all, as I said, we start from customer. So when we start from customer, that means uh, the most of the changes happen by different uh, opportunities in terms of seasonality or linked to something specific which happening on sport. Imagine a World Cup or a marathon or an event. So in general, it depends on what period of time, what kind of customer will be expecting. So that's the first criteria of the filter on which the things are organized inside the store. Then it depends on the kind of product category and the kind of pricing structure 
they'll be expecting to see when they arrive at store. And of course, you also read a lot of data. And this data comes from the analytics in the city, linked to the catchment, and linked to the purchase behavior. So these all add up to this kind of uh, organization which we set up at the store. Uh, but of course, there are a lot to do which we could improve in the future as well. So we are working on that as well. So is there a software that you're using? Uh, no, for the retail, no, no, no. There's no wow. software as dynamic. of now. Uh, it, it's it's based basically based on the understanding of the customer. And no, you I, use no, I understand the configuration. I'm saying when you have to execute it and give instructions to the store, there's a certain SKU that needs to be brought from the back of house and to be put uh, in the store. Is that so if you're asking about the availability, of course, you do do on the tools. But in terms of organization, no, we don't use the software. Wow. Yeah, thank, thank you. Thank you. We have time just for one more question. If anybody else has that. All right. So you've been a great audience, great panel. Thank you so much. You know, appreciate your time. Some great insights. I'm sure that the whole audience over here has definitely, you know, learned something and everyone's taking something back. So thanks again.